Alright, today we're going to start in chapter 10, Diseases of the Urinary System. So I'm going to start with your PowerPoint and we're going to, as usual, go over some common anatomy and physiology of the urinary system. So let's begin on page 236 in your text. Um, the urinary system is also called the genitourinary system, or, I'm sorry, the genitourinary system because we do consider the penis and the vagina as part of the, uh, it is a gen their genitals and they're part of the urinary system. So we call it the genitourinary system as well. Um, it uh, works similar to a filtration system because waste are the only thing that, that is um, eliminated out of the urethra uh, and it does filter the good stuff and from it and the bad stuff and then basically after you digest everything then what you have left is your urine and so it works by water filtration basically the same way so in it, it, its function to filter and remove waste uh, products from the blood and then of course that's put into um, a fluid and excreted as urine um, there's a video there that shows you a good anima animation, excuse me, so you can look at that. Um, little bits and pieces about the urinary system. It is the hardest working system because it's always filtering constantly. It doesn't have a break. Filtering blood, filtering blood, and if it ever slows down, which it naturally will as we age, but as, when, as we get older, you'll notice that you do have more and more urinary problems because um, it does slow down. Everything slows down in your body as you get older. So um, the metabolic process in the body produces a lot of waste and it's the urinary system job, uh, system's job to filter that waste and excrete it from the body. Um, let's see, filtration takes place in the nephron and the nephron is the basic unit of the kidney and um, and then in the nephron we have a lot of tubules like um, the glomerulo, nef uh, glomerulus and um, the tup uh, loop of Hen Henle and different ones like that and we'll go into that a little later. Um, but urine, it forms in the kidney, it goes through two, one or two ureters, whichever kidney, each kidney will form waste or form urine, it will go into the ureters and empty into the urinary bladder and then from the bladder is excreted through the urethra. The kidneys are located behind the perineum or the retroperitoneal area. These are held in place by renal fascia and so they're actually right in here kind of in your obliques and that's why when you have a kidney infection a lot of times your back will hurt because your kidneys are actually located closer to your back and they're about right in here right in this area where you can get them and they're actually pretty deep in there um, but like I said they are held in place by renal fascia by some connective tissue and it's protected by a layer of fat that way you, they're not damaged very easily um, let's see after the kidneys filter the blood the clean blood is returned to um, circulate in the body and the process just keeps going and keeps going so let's keep going um, it, the kidneys are responsible for homeostasis of the body because they have to produce a proper balance of water and sodium um, and other chemicals in the body. And so that's how they contribute to homeostasis of the body. They regulate the levels of electrolytes. I mean, you have your sodium, your potassium chloride, um, bicarbonate. It maintains the pH sometimes. Well, your, P, your urine pH should be about 6.0, which is just slightly acidic. Um, the lower the pH, the more acidic, the higher the pH, the less acidic. And so sometimes when we have a uh, very acidic urine, uh, it could indicate a um, bacterial infection, or if we have a very alkaline urine, it can indicate another condition. So um, it does regulate a lot of different things. Um, you can look over the slide that talks about the different parts of the kidney and I'm going to skip that um, for lecture purposes so we can actually get into the diseases. Um, as I told you, the nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. It can be seen under the microscope 
and there's actually more than one million in each kidney more than one million nephrons in each kidney uh, let's see um, there's three stages of urine production the first is filtration and this is going to occur in the renal um, in the renal tubules basically and this is where it's going to remove water sugar amino acids electrolytes um, and this happens when um, body fluid moves across the glomerulus it will collect all these what I call them goodies the, the good stuff from body fluid um, and then it reabsorbs so reabsorption is the second step and this passes through four sections of tubules um, and then this is where most of the water will be uh, reabsorbed into the um, capillaries um, let's see and then the last stage is secretion and this is where special cells of tubules secrete ammonia and um, it also secretes uric acid directly into the tubules then um, we have the Bowman's capsule this is um, where the majority of the filtration takes place and uh, then it goes into the proximal convoluted tubule and this is where we have a lot of sodium chloride that's reabsorbed uh, at this point and then at this point um, the proximal tubule will secrete urea, creatinine, and waste. Okay, And sometimes you, you may notice that a physician may order what we call a BUN and creatinine clearance. Um, and it's a urine test you have to do for 24 hours and that's what they're looking to see how your tubules, how your kidneys are filtering basically. They also regulate hormones like aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, which a diuretic is something that makes you urinate um, and or produce fluid anyway, and then it collects urine. So and you have the bladder for that. Let's see. Um, where the ureters are basically the two tubes that connect from the bottom of each kidney and they both connect there and connect into each side of the bladder. So these are lined with mucous membranes so when the urine passes through them um, it will basically not break down the inside of the tubules. And urine is always passed every few seconds and it'll just pass like as it forms it'll just spurt right in there. So every few seconds you're going to have like a little spurt into the um, through the through the ureters into the bladder and then of course the urinary bladder is a is very muscular it's uh, got three layers of muscle tissue and it's lined with mucous membranes again so the urine um, especially if the urine is real acidic it won't break down the inside of the um, we hope anyway it doesn't break down the inside of the the bladder um, it has rugae lining it so it can um, function as a muscle. It lies at the base of the pelvis behind the pubis symphysis which is your your big pelvic bone and it receives urine from the ureters and stores urine until you have the urge to urinate out of the urethra. Uh, let's see and then we have the urethra which is the canal from the bladder into um, outside of the body and um, the external opening is called the urinary meatus a lot of times you may not you may have a blocked urethra and so uh, um, sometimes you may have to have some kind of surgery to open it up sometimes with men that have um, enlarged prostate we have to catheterize them but a lot of times we're not even able to pass a catheter through the urethra to get relief for them they have to have some kind of balloon where they go in and um, open the tube so urine can pass out and they can feel relieved um, the urethra is um, eight inches long in males it could be longer and then in females it's only one and a half inches long so females because of this we are at more risk for urinary tract infections and um, because of the position of the urethra it's you know inside the the vaginal um, the labia minora basically and then um, men have it on the outside of the distal end of the penis and so uh, bacteria doesn't have very far to travel for women and that's why we get uh, infections more commonly 
Okay, so urine is made up of 95% water that contains electrolytes. It does contain toxins too, and it, it uh, contains um, nitrogenic waste as well. Uh, the normal output that you should put out within 24 hour period is about 1,000 to 2,000 milliliters. Anything over than that is, um, or anything under than that, then those amounts are indicative of some type of kidney condition going on. So let's look at the values uh, for your analysis testing. Um, I don't think it tells you in your book, but if you look in the PowerPoint, it will show you the values. Um, the color should be straw color. That's actually the normal color. It can be pale yellow, and then sometimes it can be a deep gold, depending on your medications and um, if you're menstruating or hormonal changes. All of that can make the color appear different. The odor, um, it should not, urine has a urine smell, but it should not have a foul odor, or it should not have an ammonia type odor. So if it has something that makes you kind of turn your stomach, then that is usually indicative of some kind of infection. Um, if somebody has, is spilling sugar into their urine, which is really a medical emergency, um, their, their urine may smell fruity or sugary smelling. If they have an infection, their urine will smell very foul. Um, or what we call fetid smell. Um, the appearance should be clear. Uh, it can be slightly cloudy at times, but you should be able to see from one side of the cup through the urine outside and to the outside of the cup. If it's real cloudy, you won't be able to see through it, and we call that, you know, looking at the turbidity of the urine. The specific gravity should be between 1.010 to 1.030. The pH should be about 5.0 to 8.0. Technically, we like it about 6 because that's just a tiny bit acidic. Um, protein is, you should have negative really, but if you have a trace, that's very normal, especially as you get older. I, again, I told you, you know, your kidneys stop, they kind of slow down working and it's very common to get protein in the urine. Uh, glucose, you should have none. If you ever have glucose in your urine, you should go to the emergency room because that is a sign of diabetic ketoacidosis. So never ever want glucose in your urine. Ketones should be negative and blood should be negative. And so those are your normal results for that. And then you can kind of view um, a video to see how you actually test the urine. All right, so let's start with the very first disease and we're gonna look at the glomerulonephritis. This is the very first condition on page 239. Um, glomerulonephritis is inflammation of the glomerulus that's within the kidney and uh, it doesn't, it's called, your book says non-suppurative, meaning it doesn't cause like a pus or a mucus to form, but it can degener, it can be degenerative, meaning that it may break down the kidney tissue over time and cause inflammation and possibly infection of the glomeruli. Um, this is caused from an antigen antibody reaction and um, glomerulonephritis is very commonly seen after strep infections primarily um, and especially after if, if the strep infections have not been treated um, you, may, you may see this glomerulonephritis. Um, other besides just like strep throat we may have infotigo infections that's caused by strep, um, pharyngitis, tonsillitis anything that's caused by the strep um, bacteria can make the person more common to have glomerulonephritis. So basically with this, the, the cause like I already told you is from the strep infection. Um, we can diagnose this um, by the presence of blood in the urine, albumin, um, and cast in the urine. And cast are um, kind of hard to explain without looking at them, but these are not normally found in the urine and so they are kind of transparent oddly shaped objects in the urine basically that can form when something is abnormal. Um, glomerulonephritis does primarily affect children, um, especially female children because children are going to be more prone to have strep, you know, being in daycare or in school it spreads very 
very rapidly. Symptoms are chills and fever, loss of appetite, a general weakness uh, feeling or fatigue, um, edema or puffiness um, in the feet and the ankles. So those are, you know, pretty general signs, but if the doctor should be clued in to check your kidneys if you have had a history of any kind of strep infection. The prognosis is, uh, is really good. Normal kidney function can return and um, you know if it is treated pretty fast you may have to have some bed rest and some salt restriction but other than that you usually make a, a complete recovery. You can, it does make you um, be more at risk for a frequent other attacks of glomerulonephritis so you have to be extremely careful because that can lead to a chronic condition. And then we have chronic glomerulonephritis which is the same thing except it's chronic. It goes on all the time and it persists for many years. It may have a remission and it may go through times called exacerbations where it's really, really bad. Um, and as more of these little glomeruli in the kidneys are destroyed, uh, the filtering of the blood decreases, obviously. And then um, we can get high blood pressure as a result. So to diagnose this, we can do a urinalysis. Um, and usually if the specific gravity remains low and at a certain number over a period of time, we can diagnose the patient having a chronic case of glomerulonephritis. Um, Severs disease is a non it's when non-functional kidneys shrink and uh, eventually atrophy and they just stop working altogether. So that can happen as well. And we, of course, don't want that to happen. Um, with let's say with chronic glomerulonephritis we can have uremia which is like a shock it's a toxic condition of the blood or blood poisoning and this causes kidney or in the end result is kidney failure basically and this happens when waste products are not secreted or excreted and instead they're secreted back into the bloodstream and it causes a um, uremia uh, which is an infection in blood um, the prognosis for this is um, it can cause convulsions and coma, so you have to be extremely careful with that. Um, we don't want to be become toxic with it, so you want to monitor it closely. All right, let's go on to good the good pasture syndrome. Uh, this is on page two forty one. This is a very rare problem, but it is a kidney issue. Uh, it's considered to be autoimmune disease. Um, the etiology or the cause is really unknown. Um, but what happens is protein, when it's formed in the body and it gets filtered, when it gets to the urinary system, protein isn't recognized, or it may be recognized as a foreign invader. And so body will, uh, your body will automatically start secreting white blood cells and try to attack the protein. And so, of course, this is going to uh, cause a lot of side effects. The main one is a foamy urine, and it may have like a yellow or a green foam. And now urine uh, does have some bubbles in it, and that's normal, but I'm talking like foam, like a bubble bath foam. Uh, the patient's going to have weakness, nausea, and vomiting as well. So this is pretty well recognized, but it is still rare. Um, let's see, the treatment is plasmopheresis. Um, and let's go on to renal failure. I want to concentrate on that a little bit. Renal failure happens when the kidneys stop functioning or they reach a certain low percentage that's considered to be at that point that they're not functioning good. This can be caused from a number of reasons. It can be caused from trauma, from hemorrhaging, from a blockage mainly, or it can be caused from poisons as well and a lack of blood flow. But basically what happens is your creatinine and uh, your urea are not excreting like they're supposed to and you get a buildup. And so that's why another reason why we do the BUN and creatinine clearance. It can be a blood test or the more common thing to do is to do the 24 hour urine for that. Um, <clears throat> let's look at acute renal failure. I think your book skipped over the um, lupus erythematosus, but we actually discussed that in the dermatology chapter, so we're not going to look at that. But going back to acute renal failure, 
On page 242, this, an acute infection, remember, always develops suddenly. Acute is suddenly, chronic develops over time, and it lasts longer. This is caused by a decrease of blood flow, usually from trauma or some kind of blockage that happens all of a sudden. Um, an incompatible blood transfusion can cause this. Uh, kidney disease, like very, very severe dehydration. All of these can cause this acute renal failure. So what's going to happen is the patient's not going to be able to void um, a lot of urine. So they're going to have a decreased urine output um, or maybe even no urine at all. They're not able to produce it and that's called anuria. Symptoms of this, headache, you're going to have GI pain. Um, you'll have an ammonia breath and so that's a very common sign to look for ammonia breath because you're, you're getting a buildup of that nitrogen in your body. And then you're going to have hyperkalemia, which is um, increased potassium in the blood. And this is going to cause a lot of leg cramps and muscle weakness. And it can slow the heart down too, to the point where you may have a heart attack. So it's very um, dangerous to have. If you do treat it well, the prognosis is really good. If it does cause kidney failure, well, that's obviously what we're talking about, but uh, we have to treat whatever is causing the kidney failure. And with chronic kidney failure or renal failure, we just kind of have to make sure the patient's having dialysis and keeping, keeping going with, with life. And so the treatment for acute and chronic renal failure is dialysis until the blood, until the kidneys start functioning like they're supposed to. And then chronic renal failure is the same thing except it is long term. Um, we can get it from high blood pressure, we can have it from diabetic nephropathy, um, and then we can have it when poisonous substances accumulate in the blood and they can cause chronic renal failure. So the same, it's really the same symptoms and, and everything except not quite as severe. You, you'll still have the ammonia type breath, um, your, your vision may decrease, the nervous system is going to, you know, the whole function of the nervous system is going to decrease, and every once in a while it could cause coma, but um, usually, usually we don't see that. Um, these patients are going to have to do dialysis quite a bit. So let's go on to pyelonephritis on the bottom of page 243. This is a superlative inflammation of the kidney and the renal pelvis and it's called, caused by E. coli um, and so superlative meaning you know, mucus forming or pus forming so um, E. coli is normally found in the colon and it's a totally normal thing if it stays where it's supposed to be in the colon but when we introduce it by wiping incorrectly into the urethra, it can cause this condition known as pyelonephritis. And um, we, we can also have strep and uh, staph infections that can cause this as well. Um, pyelonephritis is an ascending infection, meaning it came from, you were exposed to it from um, like wiping incorrectly or from germs that you and basically you introduced it yourself into your body, um, into the urethra. So um, let's see, if it's a descending infection, this means that it's uh, instead of carried in by the urethra, um, it's going to be carried in um, by the blood. Um, so it could, you know, you could have swallowed it or something like that. And so it can be an ascending or descending infection. The treatment for this, um, well the symptoms of this is the abscess formation in the kidneys and pus and urine that's called pyuria. Um, the abscesses can fuse a lot of times and when that happens the whole kidney can become very uh, purulent, meaning it's pus filled. Um, if the renal failure occurs and uremia develops, that can be very dangerous for the patient. And so you really have to monitor those abscesses to make sure that they are um, being controlled. Uh, let's see, symptoms for this, we're going to have chills, high fever, 
sudden back pain, excuse me, sudden back pain that spreads over the abdomen, painful urination. Um, let's say uh, for diagnostic procedures, we can look at urine under the microscope and we'll see um, mucus threads and, and pus in the urine. We'll see bacteria and we'll see blood in the urine, which is also called hematuria. For the treatment, we're going to give antibiotics, very strong antibiotics like Cipro or something, or Flagyl, something like that, that will get rid of the pyelonephritis. Okay, going on to pyelitis, which is similar, but it is a different term. Let's look at page 244. This is the inflammation of the renal pelvis, and um, the renal pelvis is right in between the ureter and the kidney, basically. Um, this can be caused again by E. coli or any kind of other pus-forming bacteria, like strep or staph, can both cause um, pus to form in the bacteria. So this um, can result from a bladder infection that you've had, and it may, you know, may have gone untreated and descends into the ureter, into the renal pelvis, um, or it can be carried in the blood. Uh, from what you have and then land in the kidneys. You know, stuff tends to light the kidneys and the liver infections do anyway. So it can again be ascending or descending infection. This is common in young children, especially girls, again because the urethra is shorter and usually young female children do not know how to wipe appropriately and they introduce E. coli in from the uh, rectum into the vagina and into the urethra. Um, and so, of course, this is when we can have that ascending infection from the urethra into the renal pelvis. Um, the main symptom here is going to be extremely painful urination and an increased frequency and an increased urge to go. Um, and then your urine may have some, some mucus in it as well. Urinalysis is usually what we're going to do to see the infection, and urinalysis will, uh, like a microscopic urinalysis, will reveal a lot of mucus threads in, in the urine sample. Treatment is antibiotics. The earlier we get started with it, the better. All right, let's go into renal carcinoma on page 245. Um, this is all known as um, hypernephroma and it's enlargement and destruction of the kidney. Um, it is very rare, but it can happen, okay? Um, and it is malignant cancer, like I said, it's a carcinoma. Um, you can have a transitional cell carcinoma and you can have a sarcoma as well. But um, this occurs more often in male patients and it also occurs more in people that smoke. In fact, smoking or any kind of smokeless tobacco is the most common cause of um, renal carcinoma. The symptoms, you're going to have blood in the urine. It won't cause any pain, but you'll have blood in the urine. You may have a loss of appetite over time, uh, weight loss over time, and of course anemia, which is uh, low iron levels in the blood, more than likely. The prognosis is good unless it's metastasized. If it metastasizes, usually that's uh, in stage four, but unfortunately a lot of people may not catch this until it has metastasized to the liver, the lungs, or the brain, in which then it's very hard to treat. Um, it can also metastasize to the bones as well. Alright, let's look at Wilms tumor. This is a common tumor of the um, urinary system, and it's a, a tumor of the kidney pelvis that develops in really young children. So this is a children's um, tumor. This is an adenocarcinoma that develops from abnormal fetal tissue that's left behind while you're um, forming, basically, when you're still an embryo. So the very first stages of um, embryonic development is when this is going to happen. Um, and so if you ever know somebody that has this, that, that is the reason. It grows extremely fast and it metastasizes extremely fast. Uh, through the lymph and the blood, and so this is not a very good outlook for for a child with Wilms tumor. The signs and symptoms: it um, usually you're going to see patients uh, under five years of age with this. You're going to see a mass uh, that may be seen through the skin, um, blood in the urine, pain, vomiting, high blood pressure, 
Um, so all of these are signs. In the prognosis, we can do surgery, radiation, but if it's metastasized, usually there's, there's not a good outlook at all. Um, Wilms tumor is also considered to be genetic in some cases, and so if we do have this that is genetic in the family, it's very uh, important that you follow up with a nephrologist or something all the time to make sure that um, your child is not going to develop this. Okay, going on to kidney stones or renal calculi or urinary calculi. Um, this happens pretty frequently. Um, the symptoms is going to be extreme pain, especially when it leaves um, the kidneys and goes into the ureter and the bladder and it starts passing through the urethra. The urethra, that's when it can cause some major pain and it's, they're usually tiny, 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 but they will cause an enormous amount of pain and it'll cause um, hematuria, blood in the urine, nausea, vomiting, even fever, diarrhea, um, so it's, it can be very, very painful. Um, what happens with this is salts in your body will precipitate and land and as they land in one area and, and as it accumulates it will form into a stone and it's usually encased with bacteria as well and this attracts calcium and then when calcium gets in the mix it forms a kidney stone and then it will usually dislodge and start moving through the urinary tract and it can be really painful. Um, the types of renal calculi, we have the calcium stones, which is the most common. We have the uric acid stones with people that have uh, gout. Um, we have the struvite stones um, that can make urine very alkaline um, because they have a lot of bacteria in it. Um, and then we can have the cysteine, the cysteine stones. Um, so those are the different kind of stones we can have. The cause of renal calculi, severe dehydration can happen when we're not intaking a lot of fluids or we've lost a lot of fluids, urinary tract obstruction, recurrent UTIs, um, and it can be genetic as well. And a lot of people that I know that have these, they are genetic and it's a lifelong battle that they have to go through. The symptoms, excruciating flank pain, the flank means on the sides right here, especially as the stone enters the, ure the ureter and it becomes lodged. And this is known as like a colic type of pain. And then it will start radiating towards the groin and the genitals. And then as it moves through, after it passes and comes out of the urine, it the patient is relieved, but it's usually torn up the urinary tract on its way out. Um, to diagnose this, we usually do an IVP, an intravenous pilogram, and this shows us where the kidney stones are. We can also do an ultrasound or a scan and a KUB x-ray, which is, stands for kidney, ureters, and bladder. And um, it's, um, it, it will show us, hopefully, where, where the stones are. Treatment for this, um, we you can give medicine that will partially dissolve the stones to make it a little more comfortable to pass. Um, you can have surgery to blast the stone so it's easier to pass, and then you can have treatments where you um, get into water and try to pass it, um, and you can take medicines from then on to try to prevent buildup of renal catheter. Okay, hydrolithotripsy is what I was telling you, um, but it's out of water, and that's where it, the stone is shattered and a lot easier to, to pass through. And then nephrotripsy is when the patient is in water, and it's in a tank of water which um, you have an acoustic shock, uh, shock waves that are in it that will break up the, the um, kidney stones and make it a lot more easier to pass and um, they they kind of look like little grains of sand when they're passed and we do have to strain the urine to make sure it is passed. So to prevent these you want to increase your fluid intake 8 ounces of water per hour during the day in order to keep the urine a light color but I don't know, I, 8 ounces of water, um, 8 glasses of 8 ounces of water 
um, a day is really good. I wouldn't do eight glasses an hour. That's a little much. Uh, the diet, you want to reduce sodium, increase, uh, I'm sorry, reduce your protein as well. All right, going on to hydronephrosis on page 248. This is a dilated kidney, and um, you can have several different stages of severity. It depends on how blocked the kidney is. The cause is usually stones, uh, renal calculi. It can be a tumor as well or an enlarged prostate, which a lot of men will have this, and it can be a congenital defect um, or an obstruction from another area of the urinary system. Um, <clears throat> ureters, if, if these are affected, it's called hydrourters, and um, ureters, if we have a hydrourter, um, infection, the ureters are going to be above an obstruction, they're going to be dilated. And we can have a um, ureterosil. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, a ureterosil can cause hydronephrosis and this is when the terminal portion of the ureter prolapses and goes into the bladder. And that can be extremely painful, and that can make the bladder um, kind of stag and go in and try to go into the urethra as well. Um, let's look at urinary incontinence. Um, this, because this is a, a big condition that can happen. Hold on, I want to make sure that we have it. Okay, I think the PowerPoint's just going out of order. Um, let's look at, in your book at page 249, at polycystic kidneys, because I want to make sure I cover everything. Polycystic kidney is a kidney that's covered in cysts, and um, these are known as renal cysts. Um, they're pretty common. They, um, the cysts are dilated little tubules, basically, so it's very similar to hydronephrosis. Um, little tubules that are inflamed and dilated and they can become infected, so you kind of have to watch it very carefully. Um, and as they become larger, they can affect the kidney tissue and start pressing on the kidney tissue and, and uh, cause pain for the patient. So um, signs and symptoms of this is gonna be um, high blood pressure, kidney stones, um, you can have blood in the urine, um, increased urination. So those are gonna be your main signs there. There's not really any treatment of, uh, for this, but it can, um, it w well, it will cause renal failure eventually. Um, but, you know, that's a slow, pretty slow process. And so usually you want, the patient wants to have a kidney transplant or they have to do dialysis for the rest of their life. And then if you look at diseases of the urinary bladder and urethra, we have cystitis. And this is inflammation of the bladder. Um, this is usually caused by infection more, most commonly. Again, it's more common in females than males because we have the shorter urethra. Um, and it is caused by E. coli. So the symptoms of this can be painful urination. You may have a foul-smelling um, urine. Uh, frequent, frequent urination, painful urination. Um, you may have some back pain, fever. So those are your main symptoms. Of that treatment is going to be antibiotics and a lot of a lot of water and cranberry juice to help clear clear up the uh, urinary tract. Okay, so now we can go on to urinary incontinence on page 250. And urinary con and incontinence can happen actually from several different reasons. And but basically, it's not really a disease. It's usually a symptom of a condition or a disease. But it's involuntary release of urine. And so. Um, you accidentally may urinate on yourself. Um, this can happen with multiple births, especially multiple, um, if you've had large, pregnant, large um, births, um, pregnancy, your belly was very large, it can weigh on your bladder um, and cause this. And then if you've ever had a hysterectomy, your uterus kind of helps support your bladder. And so the bladder can start to sag a little bit after that. So we can have um, overflow incontinence, stress incontinence, and urge incontinence.
Um, <clears throat> so incontinence that continues into the early juvenile years uh, is called enuresis. Uh, neurogenic bladder is also a term. Give me one second. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, um, neurogenic bladder is another condition, kind of common, and this is um, a systemic condition, meaning you have like some kind of nervous function, dysfunction going on that's causing you to um, have that involuntary urination. Um, let's see, we already talked about the polycystic kidney, and um, let's look at carcinoma of the bladder. We've talked about kidney carcinoma, but we haven't talked about carcinoma of the bladder. But carcinoma of the bladder or bladder cancer is, again, um, usually caused by smoking cigarettes. Um, it can also be caused from exposure to um, chemicals like uh, asbestos and, and things like that. Um, the tumor can grow and send little projections into the bladder and um, these can usually be diagnosed with a cystoscope, a little scope that goes into the bladder to look around. Um, they can be removed but usually they grow back and, um, and they start growing into the bladder wall and it can be very hard to manage that. The treatment is we use an infusion of a, called a BCG solution, Bacillus comet Guerin, Guerin, I believe. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. But, um, um, and we use surgery, of course, to remove the little projections that grow in there. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Urethritis is the next thing. This is usually happens with cystitis because urethritis is inflammation of the urethra, and usually if you have cystitis, you will have urethritis too. Um, it, uh, for for males, if males have urethritis, this is usually due to gonorrhea or a syphilis infection or chlamydia infection. So we're gonna have like a discharge uh, from the urethra, an itching sensation around the urethra, and uh, burning during urination. Women can have this too as part of an actual infection too. Um, in females, um, we may have an obstruction of the urinary opening um, and sometimes that can cause this urethritis. So antibiotics we're going to use for, for men and women because it's still a bacterial infection. Some common diagnostic tests that you can do for any of the renal um, organs. We can have urinalysis, um, we're going to look at blood tests. Ugh. Hold on. Okay, back to where I was. We can do blood tests for dehydration, um, a BUN blood test, a creatinine and ammonia blood test, and then um, some diagnostic, other diagnostics um, as far as radiology goes is we can do IVP, the pilogram, um, we can do the cystoscopy, um, the ultrasound, a, cat, a CT scan or a CAT scan. Um, we can do like a a micturation reflex. This like it's kind of like a nerve test, but it it's like a sphincter control test to see if you're able to stop urination. Um, it'll look at the muscle tone basically, um, and that is about it. Um, the back of your book talks a little bit about dialysis, so you can look over that. The most common dialysis is the hemodialysis and. We will stop right there for today.